worship with us here at St Andrew's Church of Scotland, Brussels. On this, the third Sunday in uh, Lent, the 12th of March 2023. May God bless you as you share with us, as we join together on this midpoint of the Lenten journey. And my prayer is that you'll hear, you'll experience something that may help you in your own walk um, with Jesus, wherever you are whatever your situation in life. Our theme today is At the Right Time. And we're looking at a passage in Paul's letter to the Romans, where he deals with the plans which were carried out through Jesus, through his life, his death, his resurrection, that that was the right time. And what all that means uh, to us. I'm delighted to be able to welcome my friend, uh, Graham, Reverend Graham Austin, as our guest preacher today. Graham is Minister of the Church of Scotland in Rotterdam, Scottish International Church Rotterdam in the Netherlands. So we're almost neighbours, uh, a mere 120 kilometres away, 75 miles or so, but there's a very nice fast train between the two. Dee, Graham's wife, will be bringing to us our readings from Psalm 95 and uh, from Romans 5. Now, our call to worship. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. The Lord is a great God. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts. Praise to you, O Christ, King of glory. Blessed are those who have endured temptation. They have stood the test and received the crown of life. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. I am the light of the world, says the Lord. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. Now let's worship God in a hymn setting of our reading, Psalm 95, which you'll find in the hymn book at number 59. O come and let us to the Lord in songs our voices raise. With joyful noise, let us the rock of our salvation praise. Let us worship God.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we come before you this morning, we surrender to you, the God who holds the depths of the earth in his hands. We come before you with thanksgiving and sing for joy to the rock of our salvation. We thank you, all-embracing God, for your example to us in all that we do. We thank you for your example of inclusion and of breaking down barriers, for the assurance that we are part of your beloved creation and that we are welcomed into your family. Gracious God, thank you for the hope that comes from endurance and the knowledge that we are reconciled to you, the one who loves each one of us beyond our imagining. God, when we are far from you, you are gracious to us and you call us your children. When we fall short of your glory, be gracious to us and in your mercy, forgive us. When we are weak and we give in to selfish desires, be gracious to us and in your mercy, forgive us. In this time of Lent, we look to you for strength and we pray that our spirits will only yield to you. We come to you united as a church and as your believers in worship, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, Jesus told a story about a boss who gave his workers some money to use for him while he was away. And he said, take this money to make more money for me. Well, one man got one gold coin, another one got two gold coins, and the best worker, I guess, got five gold coins. Use these well until I get back, said the boss. Now the best worker who'd got uh, five gold coins, bought and sold things and put the money as it were to good use. And he made five more gold coins for his boss. The man with two coins also made them work for him. And he invested, he bought things, he sold things. He made them work. He used those gold coins well, and he made another two. But the third man, who was hmm, kind of lazy, he got one, dug, one gold coin. And what did he do? Well, he dug a great big hole <laughs> and he buried it in the garden where it was no use to anyone. I'm going to leave it here until my boss gets back. He thought. He wasn't very clever, was he? Well, the boss came back and he wanted to know what they had done with his money. The man with the five gold coins, you remember, he had made five more. The man with the two coins had made two more. Well done, said the boss. Now you two are, are good workers. You can, you can be boss of others if you like now. The lazy man said, I hid the gold coin because it isn't fair if you get money that I work for, or something like that. Even in my bank, that money would grow, said the boss. You're a very lazy person, aren't you? That was a rather strange story for Jesus to tell, for various reasons. 
but it has a very clear message and it's this don't bury your gift hiding away somewhere where nobody can see it don't be frightened of god don't think that just because god is fearsome is great is holy that you should do nothing for him or that you could do nothing for him the message of that story is use your talents use your abilities use your gifts you've been given them now what are you going to do with them at the end of your life will be able to say lord you gave me so much and i was so glad for it and i used those gifts and look i did those other things for you here's the fruit here's the harvest of what i did or will you like the lazy man just have to admit well no i was scared or i didn't want to or whatever and i hid my talent away don't hide it use it psalm 95 come let us sing for joy to the lord let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song for the lord is the great god the great king above all gods in his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him the sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land come let us bow down in worship let us kneel before the lord our maker for he is our god and we are the people of his pasture the flock under his care today if only you would hear his voice do not harden your hearts as you did at meribah as you did that day at massa in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me they tried me though they had seen what i did for 40 years i was angry with that generation i said they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways so i declared on oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest amen romans 5 1 to 11 Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our own sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Amen. Well, hello. It's, it's nice to be part of your online service today. You know, there is a moment in every action movie, almost every action movie, where, where all is lost. Any chance of escape for the main characters are blocked. No ammunition, uh, no secret doors. Their backs are against the wall and the enemies are closing in and have their targets in their sight. All hope is lost. The next thing to expect is death. The characters grab each other's hands and 
Close your eyes in acceptance of their inevitable fate. Death has come calling and all hope is lost. But then, suddenly, through the skylight, it, rappelling down a rope, guns blazing, comes a hero dispatching the enemies with ease. When the people were powerless to do anything, the hero comes at just the right time. Romans 5, 1 to 11 is all about a rescue for those whose sins has them backed up against the wall. All avenues have been tried and there is no escape from the wages of sin, which is death. There is nothing to do but wait for the inevitable. All hope is lost, but at just the right time, Christ. This is the scenario that Paul has been painting in his letter up to this point. Some tried to claim ignorance, but that was no excuse. Jews claimed ancestral privileges. Being God's people was enough to escape God's righteous judgment. And Paul would challenge another attitude towards the law that the Jews treasured so much. They thought it was their safeguard. However, however, it had to be kept perfectly. So Paul declares, rather depressingly, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died. This is the hero of Paul's letter to the Romans. He who will be the answer to all the problems of sin and death of being cornered by fear, trapped by guilt, surrounded by condemnation that Paul speaks about in his previous chapters. And look at what Jesus brings in his week. Justification, being put in the right place with God. Grace, the undeserved love of God. Peace, the inner sense of wholeness. Hope, not just in the moment, but for tomorrow. Salvation, a rescue from certain death and reconciliation, enemies brought together. This hero comes at just the right time and doesn't crash through a skylight in a big dramatic entrance, but in the quietest way possible. Little known parents, a small town, a manger, the first witnesses, shepherds. And Jesus, of course, doesn't dangle from a rope but hangs on a cross, seemingly helpless as he doesn't take life but gives it and prays for his enemies. He shields those who would reject him with his very life at just the right time. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, this may come as a shock, but we were the enemies of God, not, not just because of our sin, but because we were, as Paul describes, ungodly. Or in other words, godless. The emphasis here is on less. We had shunned God, ignored God and rejected God. We could not have been in a more desperate state, utterly helpless to save ourselves, utterly godless to deserve help. And yet help comes nonetheless when we, are, when we were at our most powerless, our most godless, while we were still sinners. There was and, and is no reason in the whole universe why God in Christ is obligated to save us other than God's amazing grace towards even us who gave no thought to our Creator at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. But the right time that Paul speaks of here has a past and present and future effect. You see, Jesus came at the right time for all time. We have, we have been justified, put right with God. Verse 1, justified through faith, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to a future with God, verse 2, the hope of glory. 
And between those, uh, these two times, uh, past and, and future, God fills the present with this grace in which we now stand again. Verse 2. All this for us, who were backed up against the wall with nowhere to turn, staring a death in the face, no secret doors which will suddenly open for us. There we go. <laughs> this, this passage, Romans 5, 1 to 11, just oozes with, with good things for us, all done while we were in a state of rebellion. And so we should sing to God's praise with the words of Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Romans 5, 1 to 11. Paul has outdone himself. He, he could retire on these words. So why, why, why? Why does he seem to take the shine off with verse 3? But we also glory in our sufferings. Everything around this verse is just great. Yes, we thank God for Jesus and, and what he's achieved through the cross and resurrection. The suffering bearing the wrath that is rightfully ours. For his death that brings justification, grace, peace, hope, salvation and reconciliation. But suffering for us to endure and, and rejoice in. And this brings hope. Scott Hosey, uh, a name I know you will be familiar with, explains that all through the Gospels, these two things are held in tension, suffering and hope. And as you look around the church, we see the cross, uh, the communion table, the cup and the bread, all these important symbols that we cherish involve suffering. It is the price that Jesus paid so that hope, could come, and justification, grace, peace, salvation, and reconciliation. That may help us to cope with and even rejoice in the sufferings we may endure, because ultimately they do not have the last word. From death on the cross came life. From the cup and bread, symbols of suffering, come words of mercy. Yes, we, we may have to endure suffering, but please be sure that God, that Paul rather, is not saying suffering is always good. Some of it, like those people sheltering in the ruins of their houses in Ukraine, well, it's just plain evil. So we must pray in hope for those who suffer unfairly, those in Syria, Turkey, as well as Ukraine and many other places around the world. If we are honest, we might find ourselves praying the controversial line from 1984, uh, the Band-Aid single, Do They Know It's Christmas? And the line goes, well, tonight, thank God it's them instead of you. Because it is true that some people suffer so unfairly while the rest of us get away with so little. But somehow suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and, and character in this present gives hope. Could it be, as Scott says, if God could turn a cross into a doorway to life, then he can take our sufferings and use them to shore up our hope. In fact, sometimes we suffer more precisely because we hope for a better world. We are not content to accept that the way things are for now are always the best they could be. And when will all this be, this, this glory we live in hope of? It will happen just at the right time. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Father, we praise and thank you for the gift of fellowship and for the chance this weekend to spend time together as members of an international presbytery. We pray for our members all over the world. We bring before you congregations facing big challenges, some new beginnings and some endings. Father, it's not always easy to face new situations. Help us to see these changes as an opportunity rather than a threat. Father, lead us from doubt to belief. We look around us at your world and we see so many problems that it's easy to be disheartened. And yet the Bible tells us to bring these problems to you. You are the all-powerful creator who can vanquish evil and make good, turning the negative into positive. Father, lead us from disheartenment to faith. So we pray for your world and especially for those of our brothers and sisters who are suffering. We think of the millions affected by the earthquake in Turkey and Syria and those still suffering in the aftermath of other disastrous events such as the train crash in Greece. May they find the support and comfort they need in the face of such enormous loss. Father, lead them from despair to hope. We bring before you the many places in your world that are being destroyed by conflict. Places where people live in fear of death every day and where they're bombarded by messages of hatred and aggression. We think, of course, of Ukraine and Russia but also of Ethiopia, Myanmar, and places such as Mexico, Colombia, Iran, Palestine, and so many others where violence is an everyday occurrence. Father, lead them from war to peace and from hatred to love. We look at the children around us and wonder what sort of world we will leave behind for them. What sort of world they will grow old in. Climate change will bring many problems, not of their making. Father, show us where we're going wrong now, so that we can work together to mitigate the damage already done. And help us to equip the next generations with the resilience and resourcefulness they will need. Father, lead us from pessimism to optimism. Finally, in a moment of silence, we pray for ourselves and those we're close to. We think especially of those who are suffering, either physically or mentally, for those struggling with bereavement or loneliness, with stress or anxiety. Father, lead them from sickness to health, from denial to acceptance, and from sadness to joy. Almighty Father, we place all of these, your children, in your loving hands, secure in the knowledge that you will cradle and nurture them in their time of need. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you so much for sharing with us today. I hope that you've been encouraged by Graham's message on the right time and that in this Lenten time, as we journey with Jesus towards Jerusalem, you have a clear idea of what the Lord is doing in your life and also a clear idea of what way you could be using your talents for the good of the kingdom, not hiding them away, not burying them in your garden, as it were. Now, our jumble sale takes place next Saturday, 18th of March, 2023. Lots of work has been put into this by Linda and her team. And I do hope that you're able to share with us and be able to support it. It'll no doubt be a great opportunity for us to raise funds for the charity. And the one that Linda and her team have chosen is Rolling Douche, which offers washing facilities for people on the streets here in Brussels. And sadly, there are many thousands of them. It's a great idea and it's very helpful, a really compassionate, uh, compassionate uh, project indeed. Now, the jumble sale is next Saturday, the 18th of March at 10 in the morning. Go on until half past one in the afternoon. You can bring things to the church hall on the uh, evening before, starting at five o'clock until about eight or so. Um, we're keen to receive baking also from the, uh, for the very popular uh, cafe stall. Uh, if you can help with those stalls in any way, please let Linda know or contact me in the usual way via our website, churchofscotland.be. Now, our friends in the local mosque, in collaboration with various organisations, are inviting us to an iftar, a special holy meal during the course of Ramadan. A few of us were privileged to share with them last year. It was great. It was very interesting. It was a lovely time of sharing together with people of different faiths and indeed of no faiths at all. Now, they'd like us to join with them then on Friday, the 24th of March. That's under, 20, under two weeks away, but they need to know numbers uh, a good bit before, a few days before that. So if you're interested, do let me know how many people to register and whether you'd like to visit the mosque beforehand at around half past five. The Iftar is in the cultural centre on Avenue de la Couronne here in Brussels uh, and that's on the evening of Friday the 24th of March 
around about 7, 7.30 or so. You'll be made very welcome. And it's free. But uh, what they are doing is they're, they're uplifting a free will offering, which will go to a very well-deserving charity. And now to close our benediction. Be joyful in the Lord, all you people. Serve the Lord with gladness and be sure that the Lord is a good God. It's he who made us. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. So go your way into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him for the Lord is gracious and his mercy is everlasting. And may his grace, his mercy, his peace be yours now and forever, world without end. Amen.